I'll start. Thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Nika, and uh, I am a 3D generalist and animator from Tbilisi, Georgia. And I'm here to talk to you about puppets. So we've heard about the giant stuff, like the, the shows and the pipelines and stuff, but now we need to get infinitely smaller and talk about puppets and the real ones too, because um, I am representing a stop motion animation studio called Phantasmagoria. This is our logo and this is what we do. We are uh, based in Tbilisi. We are a new studio, just had uh, like one year anniversary just last month. So this is the first short film that we're working on and uh, we're also a very young company. It's also, uh, it's called, I don't know what it's called in English. It's a social factory, I think. So we basically teach kids, the students, uh, and then the students, once they graduate, they make films. So this is the first one. And as you can guess, we are also a very young company. I'm also actually one of the older ones. And uh, we like to not only have this traditional medium with this all traditional means, the stop motion is very traditional and handmade, right? It's, uh, that's why we love it. But we also try to integrate, integrate and uh, adapt to all new technologies that we can. And that's why I'm here. Uh, because we decided the directors were very adamant from the start to use 3D printed replacement parts. Sorry about that, the font got mixed in the, the conversion to Linux, okay. So, uh, if you don't know what is a replacement part in the stop motion animation, it is the one way to create uh, the illusion of motion. As you know, the stop motion is one frame is each shot. So, you, to create a motion, you can uh, deform the object and you basically sculpt the animation or the second way is to have them sculpted beforehand as a op separate objects for each frame as you can see on the picture and just replace them and attach to the puppet one frame at a time and usually uh, uh, traditionally in like uh, before I think like 10 or 15 years it was done also by hand so people will just create every replacement part by hand they will sculpt it and that was, I think, one of the most time-consuming aspects of stop-motion animation. It was, uh, it could take months to years uh, if you have like full-length animation. So once there was a chance to integrate new technology and once the 3D printing became a thing, uh, the big studios quickly adapted to it and created um, the workflow for 3D printing replacement parts. The first film, I think, that used this method was uh, like 15 years. I, I think the first one was maybe Coraline, if I'm not mistaken. So the Leica studio is using it, the uh, Artman is using it, the, the big studios, but for the smaller studios, it's it was not uh, yet, uh, it was available, but it was not yet um, feasible to do it because um, it required some uh, cost, you know, because uh, the printers costed the money, but now as it's becoming cheaper, the commercial printers are becoming cheaper, and uh, there's more softwares, more information. It's becoming good. So we have now reasons why uh, small studios can use it. It's not widely adopted yet, but the, the many studios are already using it. So it's cost and time effective if you do that. It's easier to produce and reproduce, which is important. So like if something happens and you lost the face, you the face in our case or some hand maybe, and something got corrupted, you need the copy of the one you had. It's much easier to reproduce if you have them as 3D objects and you're printing them. And they can create much better animation because you can preview the animation in 3D and print them instead of creating by hand and just you know eyeballing what animation should look like. But there's reasons why you shouldn't do it. And the, the most of it is that there is just no experience at all. There is nothing you can learn from. There's no documentation. The big studios don't really share this information. And uh, for smaller studios, it's not like when we were studying this and uh, we're Googling and searching for what we could find, there's almost nothing next to nothing. It's, uh, there's some videos where studios are talking about how they are using it, but it's mostly bragging. It's not what they're doing. It's like, oh, we're doing this and we're cool, but they don't teach you anything. They don't give you any information. So that's why uh, 
one might uh, refrain from using this method uh, because it requires some time to learn and adapt. And, uh, but we still decided to do it. Directors were a big fan of this method and they wanted to implement. Uh, so we did this. And uh, the, uh, the motivation for this presentation is that the, all the steps that we took, the, the growing pains and the, the things we had to figure out, the things we had to uh, the, the mistakes we had to make to figure out the answers, all that stuff, maybe not every studio has to go through this, not every artist has to learn from the scratch, so I want this to be a uh, case, first case maybe, of uh, sharing this experience and information, and we're going to get technical, you're going to get technical tips, so that the, the other studios and artists uh, who will use this method will have something to base their work upon. So we're going to talk about uh, for things basically first we're going to talk about uh, modeling for stop motion so what's the difference what uh, unique and intricate parts it has compared to the regular modeling we're going to talk about the same thing for 3d animation uh, mostly we're going to talk about custom tools that we created because as you can imagine because this is a very unique and uh, new workflow there's not av tools available yet that you need so you, we needed to create them and uh, lastly and also we're going to talk about the tools that we found and uh, basically change it to fit our workflow because Blender community was very helpful in every way, in direct and indirect way. We found some uh, scripts and add-ons and stuff that we could uh, uh, use in our workflow. And lastly, I'll talk about uh, how we organize and it's a fun part. Okay, so first, it's modeling. Uh, so we have the workflow basically is that we are two people in the 3D department. The studio is very small. We are just 20 people. And uh, we just have like two floor uh, studio. It's very small. And uh, we are two people working on 3D. Basically, the 3D department is me and Lasha, who's sitting there. And uh, the, our pipeline basically is that he's uh, modeling, the sculpting those faces and creating basically rigs. And then I animate them, and I send them back to him, and he prints them. So we're going to go, go through this workflow. And this is a modeling which Lasha does. I'm not doing this, but I know something, so I'm going to talk about So the, the faces at first are modeled in a very regular way. They are just sculpted, retopologized, the, the multi-res, the shrink wrap, everything. And uh, we're using references from our second puppeteer, Mariam. And we have this particular style, because our film is set in uh, at the start of the 20th century, it's uh, from, uh, I think, uh, 1919s to 1920s. 20s. So uh, we, ha we wanted to be more stylized in the, the painting style that they, they liked at the time, especially in Georgia. Uh, but then we need to create some adjustments so that when we print these, we can use them on puppets. So the first one is that we need to split the head in middle because we're not printing entire head for every uh, every frame. We just need the head, the face. The back part is static. We just print it once. We attach to the object. It's part of the, the main puppet. Uh, so we need to split it and have some mechanisms to reattach them, to have them not visible, the seams, you know, on the face. And we do some stuff for the first. We are uh, using booleans to cut out necks so that uh, we can have uh, the we can attach it to the uh, the rest of the puppet and also to have some the movement in the neck so this is uh, the theme of the the modeling for it is that we we constantly need to think about the real objects we have a 3d objects that we're modeling but we need to adapt it to the real objects that the puppeteers are creating and uh, they're very small and we need to be mindful of for example how the neck moves and how the head moves and uh, also the animation how uh, is it the neck deformable what material is it using and all that and how much gap should there be and this is a lot of trial and error because we're dealing with the millimeters and we need to print and see if it works and print if it works and so on and this is what it looks like from the uh, the down, I don't know. Um, and then we're, uh, we need some mechanisms to attach eyes, which is also the real object. So we have these uh, eye holders, I call them, that uh, are attached to the back of the head. And they are, they, the black part means the real object, so the, the, the eyes are put into that. 
and they are also static. And the eyes are I, eyes can uh, I can be created in 3D printing, but we're using the real objects, and Lasha is doing this like I don't know what it's called the material, but the the way we like the ocean stuff that is in the eyes is creating them, and that's not very possible to do it in in 3D. And also, we need to, uh, when we are doing this. Uh, First of all, the eye holders, everything should be as seen as possible because we need to put a lot of stuff in the head. We need to feed a lot of stuff that we can. And also, it's uh, not very visible here, but if I can get most, in this part, we have a gap because we are touching, of course, eyelids, which are also real objects. Uh, they are uh, molded plastic. Uh, and we need to leave some space so that the eyelids can be attached and just go up and down to create blinking. And this is what it looks like. This is uh, our face with a uh, head without a face and eyelids we're using as all stop motion artists the, the sticks to pull down eyelids and uh, create blinking effects. And um, as you can see, the next one I'm going to talk about is this, uh, the mechanism that we have up there, which is the most important one. It, it is magnet holders. So I have made some mistake on this. Uh, I have balls twice, so don't mind that. But what we're using is that we, Lasha has created uh, this uh, object, which is uh, attached to the face and also to the back of the head. And we are using two magnets on the sides so that they stick and the one ball you know, that just holds it tightly so that it doesn't move around. But uh, this is the most problematic part in uh, creating this because the creating faces, it's relatively easier, but making them uh, retractable, that was the challenge because this is basically a rig now. This is a stop motion rig. And first object was that, uh, first problem was that the subjects, the magnets are, as you can imagine, if the head is 40 millimeters, and can you imagine how much that is, how, how much length that is? So it's very small. It just we were at the point where we just couldn't find any smaller magnets on that. It just doesn't exist. At least you cannot buy it. So we had to adapt to whatever size size objects that we could find. And the biggest challenge was not attaching the faces, but removing them again because the animators have specific requirements. How this uh, the stop motion animators? I mean, how these faces should be removed and attached again because. Uh, they are doing basically for every frame and there needs to be uh, some, uh, you, you know, you shouldn't struggle with it. So it, as I wrote down, it should be easy to remove by intent and hard to remove by accident, which, may, which means that when you want to remove it, you should be able to just remove. But if you're like, for example, shaking a puppet or if you're moving the puppet, it shouldn't fall down. So we need the magnets that are holding real tight but also you can just tweak and it gets removed. So that was the challenge. That, that's, I think, the, something that we spend most of our time on in uh, pre-production. Uh, we, I mean, me and Lasha, uh, but Lasha mostly. Uh, so, because that was a big challenge. Uh, we have this, uh, there's two images missing, but that's okay. So it shouldn't, you shouldn't have to tilt the face when you remove it because on the head we have attached hair. And if you remove it by this, this motion, the, you might mess with the hairline. We don't want that. You might also mess with the eyelids. We also don't want that. You also shouldn't have to wiggle the object Oops. Uh, to remove, the, remove it because it can shake the puppet and shake the head so that if, you, like, if you're doing the, the facial animation while the head is in a motion, which is most of the time when we do this, uh, so, and you want to remove the face and you're shaking this object to you know, remove it, all the, the positioning that you worked on in a previous frame for the head is lost and you have to, to basically re-sculpt the pose and that's a terrible thing. Uh, so they should be removed, uh, there should be a picture here, but they should be removed with the forward gesture. You should be able to just hold it and remove. So you, and also you should, there's some things that you shouldn't have to touch the head, back of the head. That's the le less you touch it, the better. So it should be removable very easily. And you should also shouldn't have to use force because if you use force, it, the puppet shakes again. And just working on this was very, very intricate. And this is 
what our studio looks like all the time. We have these piles of faces from testing. And it was basically for a couple of months, Lasha was adjusting something by one millimeter or just one degree in angle and just printing again. It doesn't work again, it doesn't work again. It, it's just a trial and error. It's just it's something that you cannot uh, plan and, and you cannot uh, learn from us basically because based on puppets, you need, based on each puppet and each uh, mechanism you have, each size of puppet you have, and style of course, you need uh, to create your own uh, rig and mechanism. And uh, this is not one time thing also because now it's getting easier because we know what, what our uh, puppets need to do and Lasha has some uh, expertise on that already. But for each puppet, because you know they have different head structures and the sizes and everything, and they have to be uh, these rigs have to be created again and again. So that is uh, the most uh, time-consuming part before th uh, the animation starts. So now for the animation, this is what I do. When I uh, so one, one time, uh, one of the directors of the film approached me and. Uh, said so we created this object we were planning this project to have replacement parts and everything and uh, we we want to animate them now and uh, we don't uh, know anyone who can animate and uh, whoever we found asked us to uh, export the object uh, so that they could animate in maya and uh, they couldn't do it the turns out problem was the moltres modifier but they couldn't do it and she asked me if uh, i know how to uh, export to Maya because I know Blender and I said I don't but uh, I know how to animate in Blender and I got the job and ever since I've been working on this it's uh, been nine months now that we're working on this project and this is what I do I'm going to talk about uh, first how it differs from the regular animation that you're all used to I'm guessing and uh, then I'm going to talk about the specific challenges that we had in this project and in the stop motion uh, workflow that you might have and how we solve them. So the first, how it differs, what is unique about animating for stop motion. So we have basically two traditional 3D animation pipelines. One is just regular 3D animation, CG animation. It is when you're just creating film in 3D. That means you have uh, ability to choose whatever, frame rate, focal lengths, the, the angle for each shot, you can create lighting on your own. Maybe not you specifically as an animator, but you know, the studio can. Uh, and you have the VFX animation in which you do not create any of those because it is already provided to you. You have information about frame rate, the focal lengths and the, the, the camera sensors and everything, and lighting already exists and use HDRI. Basically, you have two workflows, one which you create the footage and one in which you already have the footage. And the stop motion animation lives in the weird middle uh, in which you're working on real footage, but it doesn't ex exist yet. It's gonna exist, it's gonna be a real footage, but it doesn't yet exist. So I have written that you must anticipate those things. And what that means is that you mustn't, when you're animating, you must not think that what you're seeing is what you're gonna get. You must anticipate that uh, the, the uh, photographers on the set and animators on the set, directors, are going to have some uh, decision-making uh, choices to make, some uh, limitations. And all of this is dependent on a lot of things in stop motion. It's not very straightforward. You cannot just decide what uh, focal lengths you're going to use because you have some weird limitations. For example, this is one shot. This is uh, the right one is what it looks like uh, the final, you know, when we shoot, but this, the left one, is what it looks like on the set. Uh, we are dealing with very small puppets and we have to do weird things to make them recordable. Especially in this shot, what was the problem is that we wanted to have uh, depths of field, the very uh, uh, hard depths of field and have this bokeh and everything. And the cameras, the, the photography cameras, to be able to detect bokeh and have the, the focal lengths on, on that scale, you need to really get close to the object. And sometimes it creates a problem. So for example, how does the animator go in and to remove the face and attach the face? So things like that, it just pops up always. And uh, we have to be mindful of that and we have to pre-plan it. We have to know what we are shooting exactly. 
down to the camera position, down to lighting positions, uh, down to where the animator goes, everything, because we have to, and me too, the animator, has, uh, 3D animator, has to animate according to that information. Because, for example, in this case, this is a lightning ca lighting case. Uh, we have in this particular shot lighting that uh, comes from above, and this is the case for most of our shots that we have uh, outside because the film is set during the night. And most of the time, the, the lighting comes from above, which is from the, the street, street lamps and the moon. And what happens is that the, the eyes and eyebrow line is very visible and lit all the time, but the mouth is hidden. So if I don't have that information, for example, in this shot, I have to create a annoyed face. She heard something from the side and she has to look and look annoyed. And if I don't have any of this information, I don't have information which side she's looking and how is the lighting set up in this scene, what focal lengths we're using, how far we are from the object, I might animate something that has like little mouth movement, but we print it and it turns out that it's not visible because first I animated the, 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 the leap that is on the second uh, the other side and we can see it. It might be that I didn't put enough weight on brows and the mouth is shadow, so it's not very visible. And it turns out I should have animated brows more. The weight of the animation, weight of the emotion, should have been put more into the brows. Uh, and it has to be, uh, it can be uh, that I, the motion of the lips, for example, or brows even, uh, or anything, is so small that from this distance it's not visible. So if I know that this shot is light like, uh, lit like this and uh, we have shadows like this, we have focal lengths and distance like this, and I know she's looking on that side. What I will do is I will animate most of the expression on the side that is visible to the camera. I will put the weight of the animation to the brows. And uh, for example, we have this thing that she's, uh, she's constantly lifting one of her eyebrows. It's quirks of the character. And I know that like, if she's looking on this side, I need to animate the brow uh, movement on the brow that is going to look away so that it creates a direction. It creates a sense of direction towards the uh, towards where she's looking. So this information has to come to me and I have to coordinate with directors and photographers and animators and have all this information before I start working because that was the case when we first start doing that. I will just create something, we'll print it and we'll just animate and we look at the shot and no emotion is visible at all. We can't see anything. So what we do is we do extensive planning. This is the case for some motion animation usually, but in this case, it's more amplified. We are basically creating each shot in every medium that we can. We have the animatics, we, have, we should reference so that we know what camera we want to use and what focal lengths we want to use. And of course, this is for the animator, the submotion animators as well. Uh, and we also do blockings a lot. We have a photographers uh, days before shooting, sometimes even earlier than that. We have them uh, just go and see each shot, how it is created, so that we know where the camera can sit. Because we can't just put anywhere. We need to have certain locations locked down. We need to have certain lighting locations locked down so that we can know that, okay, we want this lighting, is it possible? And if we know it is possible, and if we know that, okay, we're doing this, then I will start doing what I do. And the second limitation we have is the mesh deform limitations. We cannot do squash and stretches as much as in the regular sort of animation, because if, for example, I stretch face a bit too much, now it doesn't attach to the back of the head anymore, because we have a mechanism there, and we'll create this gap and the magnets will be misaligned, they will not uh, click. And we have to be more restricted to the types of animations we do. We have to be more um, conservative in that case. And this is again the same case, like if I stretch it, you can see maybe not too well, but you can see this is stretched. The magnets will basically might fall off or not even fit if the face is stretched. So we have to freeze those parts that we know are part of the rig and need to be attached to the face and animate only what is left. And it, it makes the animations more conservative, but in, in our case, I feel like it works because the film is, uh, as I said, set uh, at the start of the 20th century. It's, it's gonna be around 15 minute film. I don't know if I said that. So, um, 
it is about love, it's about poetry, it's a dramatic film, uh, so, and it's uh, about literary people. It's about uh, uh, historical events, so we do not want squash and stretches that much anyway. We do have a character which is a young girl and she's in love, so we want to have um, naivety you know, and playfulness of a uh, young person in love. So we, we need to find the balance of being uh, conservative and more uh, restricted in our facial movements, but also have some life to it. And these limitations kind of uh, not help us, but we work around it. And again, with the eyes, if I stretch eyes too much, eye sockets, uh, we will have this massive gap. We will have uh, the, re the, the back of the head visible, basically, and eyelids might not be perfectly aligned. We, we, uh, they might fall down, which is the last thing we want. It happens sometimes. But uh, what I do is I animate with shape kiss. This is the method I chose. I chose it for, I guess, the same reasons why anybody chooses to do facial animation with shape kiss, but they are more amplified, those reasons, in stop motion animation because this is the case where you want, will want to have handcrafted animations, to have each face sculpted, to not have any repetitions, to have them you know, I, I want them to feel like they are sculpted, they are made by hand, and they are basically. And I don't want them to be mechanical, so each sort of each time she smiles, oh, not she, it's just one character I'm showcasing, but each time a character smiles or something, I want it to be crafted from the scratch, to have a, a diversity, I don't know how to say it in English, but to have that diversity in emotions. And I'm using face sets to freeze out certain areas. As you can see, the the, the orange line is the part that just should not move, that is part that holds the rig at the back. And I'm also freezing eyelids. Uh, and the rest of the face I just have uh, split into shape keys so that I can use uh, auto-masking and decide if I want to uh, animate with face sets or not. You know, sometimes when I want to open the mouse, for example, the easiest way to create openings I, I found out was with the shape keys and with the elastic deform brush. That is my favorite brush in sculpt mode and it is, I don't know, it's great. It just feels like how it should feel. So I'm, I'm, I'm using it to, it's I think the only brush I use during the animation. So now the challenges. What were the challenges that were specific to stop motion and um, how have you overcome them? The first one this is the, the most basic one you're going to have. How are, are you going to convert the animation to separate objects so that you can print them? And this is something that we talked about even at the first uh, meeting that I had with the studio. That was nine months ago, I think. So it's very easy. I have this animation, which is uh, more than four frames. I'm lying here, but it is a shocked animation. And I want to have a four faces from that so that I can print four faces. An animator can just attach on frame one, object one, frame two, object two, and etc. How do I do that? Well, it's pretty straightforward if you think about this, because once you have a shape case, what you need to do is you need to duplicate the object, apply the shape case on the certain frame, and it works like it applies uh, whatever is sculpted on that uh, frame to the, uh, the mesh. It kind of works like, if you don't know, uh, closed simulations because it is uh, internally also a modifier, I think, shape case. So, and I need to move it. So at the time when I was uh, starting this project, I was getting into Blender Python. I was new to it and um, I was very excited to be able to use it in the actual production to create something actually useful for me because I knew like from testing and even before that, that this, doing this is not a good workflow. For example, uh, the first reason is that, for example, you might have 15 faces and doing these operations on 15 uh, frames, that is also one, uh, that is already 115 clicks, 50 clicks. And the second reason is that it is very unstable. You just misclick one arrow and you just jump on the sun frame, you don't know what you're doing. And once you duplicate these objects, you, there's no way to know which object is what you created because they all look the same when you just do the whole uh, interpolations as separate objects. 
So I was using Python, and uh, I want to talk about how I approached Python, Blender Python, because this is going to be a love letter to Blender Python. I, I, I'm obsessed with it, and I create every time I see that I have something that needs three clicks, for example, I realize that it can be a one click, because the way Python works is that, and also I need to do this for all friends. But what I realized that I, first I was doing notes, and then I moved into Python, and so I realized how similar it is. Uh, people are talking about how, like how notes are visual scripting, right? But for me, because I started uh, it later, uh, the, the scripting felt like textual node editing. And I realized that each line in Python, because of how well written it is and how well documented it is, each, up, each uh, step you take is each line in Python. So you can literally just write down all your steps and just write the operation for that in Python language. And the number of operations you do is a number of lines in Python. You also have like variables, which is like user inputs. You have functions, which is like node groups. So it made a lot of sense to me. And I doing, started doing all of this. Now, for duplicating, you can just do object copy, apply shape gives with shape, shape you remove, and move with location, which is old location plus whatever number I input, like seven meters. And I'm going to do this for all frames, uh, which is for frame in timeline, which you don't know it is the hidden word there for me, is for every frame in timeline. Uh, but now I have uh, 150 clicks shrank down to one. But when you go on and on, and the more and more operations uh, 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 appear that you need to do, we are talking about now thousands of clicks that I just don't need to do, and now it's more safe. But this is the easy part. Now, what what was the challenging, and when the real challenge came is how we define the variables. Now we have two variables here. One is object obj, which is simple. It's whatever I have selected. But the second one is a timeline. What? Oh, it doesn't show, but timeline should be circled. Imagine it is. What is a timeline? So I need to define what is a timeline, so which frames should be converted into animation. And this is what the, the operator looks like uh, the, in the invoke window. But the first one, the easiest one, is I have a frame range. I specify, OK, from f this frame to that frame. But that was not e enough. I needed more and more and more operations as I went along and uh, had more and more challenges. The second one is on every ends frame. Now, this is this I added because at first we were thinking about doing the animation on 24, 24 frames, but on twos instead of doing uh, the 12 frame animation, which now we do 12 frame. But at the start of the project, we were doing it by uh, 24. So I needed the ability to not print every, not uh, I'm sorry, convert every object and to skip every frame, and I added that feature. Uh, and I also added the more important uh, keyframes only, which is, um, it's an easy name, but it, it says what it does. It uh, just only creates objects for on the frames that you have keyframed, which gives you the ability to just manually just mark which uh, frames you want to be a new object. And uh, specifically for this, I created the, the, new, the, the first operator actually that I actually wrote down in Python uh, was uh, big shape key action. And I called the, the entire add-on bake shape keys because, of, because it was the first one. So I realized that when I was working and I created an animation, and okay, now I need to bake this animation because I want to have uh, animation on certain frames. Uh, and it turns out there's no bake operator. I, I thought it was, I animated with that in mind, but I went into the menu and oh, oh there, it's not. It's just for bake action. And the shape keys are not using action. Shape keys are using shape key action. So uh, there was no baking operation for that. So I created my own because what is a baking? It's just inserting frame for uh, inserting a keyframe on every frame, basically. And it turns out there is an operator for it called a sample uh, something sample keyframes, I think, or something. But I didn't know that at the time, so I wrote my own. But I added more features to it so that I have more control over which frames get keyframes so that I can use that first operator, uh, that operator first just to keyframe the, the certain faces that I want to be printed out and then use this operator with the keyframes only selected. And the last one, and uh, the most complicated one, is uh, delete duplicates, which gives me the ability to delete, escape unnecessary frames. So what is an unnecessary frame? 
uh, and these all, all are additive. They do not replace each other. Like the more you click and more you change, the, the more operations happen. So this is the animation. I have the, the same animation. Now it's seven frames. And I have seven objects from that. But you can see that when you look at the shape key values, that object five and six are exactly similar. Uh, they have the exact same shape key values. There is no visual, uh, visible difference to the, uh, between them. So I don't want to uh, print them because that is a time wasted. That is a resource wasted. And more importantly, what is wasted is uh, the time we, uh, Lasha has to paint those faces because each of the face that we print has to be painted by hand. The faces and the eyebrows and lips and the mustache, mu mustaches, if they have them, Everything has to be painted by hand, so the less objects we have to print uh, for, uh, for painting, better for us. So, uh, I need a way to detect those duplicates and avoid printing, because if I have object five, I will just leave that on the frame six and just animate with that. So I can tell, uh, I can tell the submotion animator that, okay, on frame five and six, you can use the same object and the save all the time of also from removing it. So how do you detect that? Well, the first thing you can do is you can detect by, you can write the script that checks the shape key values and compares it to the shape key values on the previous frame. So that if there is a, a similarity, it just doesn't print anymore. And that worked for a while, but uh, lim uh, limitation of that is that it only can check the previous frame. Now you can write the script that checks for all the frames in the timeline you, you give, but I wanted something different. I wanted something more foolproof and uh, more versatile. So I created uh, a naming convention because for example, in this case, what happens if instead of objects five and six, now objects four and six are similar. You know, we cannot just detect it with the, the regular script. So I created the naming convention. So the naming convention, how it works is that each time the operator is ran and the objects are created, the operator creates uh, unique names for each object based on the shape key values. Basically, I wrote some lines to convert the shape key values into a string, which you don't know means text, and then it gives this text as a name for the meshes. Now, the operator can detect that, okay, the, uh, the object six has the same exact name as the object four, so that it does not print uh, object six anymore. It gives me the line in the, comment, uh, the, the console that says that you can use object four on frame six. And the ability that it gives me also, because it is based on the naming convention and not the, the script that it checks, is that, for example, uh, if I... Uh, animated the, the first row, which is uh, more darkened. If I animate the first row on like first frame, so there should be numbers there, but I, uh, it's not showing. I created the, the animation like two days ago. That was on the frames like from one to seven or eight. And now it's two days past and I'm working on this animation and it's different animation, it's different emotion, different expression. But because they, are using the naming conventions and each mesh is named in a certain way based on shape values. When I run this script, it will tell me that, okay, on the last object, uh, you have the same exact shape keys as you had two days ago on object one. So it checks not only in the timeline, checks in the entire blend file so I can uh, detect any duplicates that might exist and avoid printing them. And that way, it's a, w it's a win for us. And um, I can also print out those names and take them into uh, a file in the, the Excel file, manually check them and everything. Now this is a shortened one. This is the, how, how do we make shape keys non-distractable because I worked the shape keys a lot. I think this year I worked the shape keys more than any person on this planet. That's all I do. I, I just do shape keys. And I, there's some things that I want from it. I want it to be faster. I want it to be more non-distractive. I want reusability, better organization. I want less, of course, which is messy, and I want to be easier to take risks. So I created some operators to help me with that. The first one is uh, shape, uh, split shape keys. Now, what it does is that sometimes, for example, uh, I create, uh, what I do is, what is better is that each uh, part of the face has its own animation, its own shape key, like mouth and a brows. But in this one, I accidentally sculpted brows on the mouth shape key. And I don't want that because some maybe director tells me that they don't go together well. Maybe they need to be offset or something. So I found this script that can split shape keys based on uh, 
uh, the vertex groups. You need to create vertex groups, you need to name them certain way, and then it just uh, like do something. And I, I thought I'm not gonna do that, it's, that's too many clicks. I know it makes it sound like that I don't like clicking, I'm lazy, and I am. So I created uh, a method I thought like, Python can create shape uh, vertex group, Python can name them, so why do I do that? Uh, so I created the operator that just, you click, if I click, why am I, oh, yeah, so you, you select the part of the face that uh, you want to be split, and you just press the button, and now we have the same exact, uh, same exact animation, but now one part of the face is on the one uh, shape key and the other on the other. The second one, no, well, it's, not, it's not going on the next frame, sorry. No, it's stuck. Okay, the next one is um, duplicate shape keys. Now this is easy, we can all get what it means, but now it's a challenge there because when I first used those operators, I realized that, okay, I, I thought, okay, I, I duplicated shape key, I have a backup, I can sculpt on that and be distractive and if something happens, I'll just use the backup. And I did that, and it turns out I lost the entire animation because I didn't just copy the shape because that's impossible. I created a new one, and the entire animation was gone. So I had to write a script that just copies the entire animation down to the last tan uh, tangent position and the last F curve and everything is copied. And also I, what was very important for me is that the shape keys are in the same place as the original one, so that I don't have to scroll, because I have a lot of shape keys, I have dozens of them. So if I have to scroll down and click this horrible arrow button to go up, I, I don't want that. And I, it also copies the shape keys and everything, it creates a, the perfect copy for every operator that I use. And the last one is a merge shape keys, which is the opposite of the split shape keys. I'm gonna contradict myself and say that sometimes you want entire animation on one uh, shape key, because you can see that my F curves are a mess because I moved one shape key, uh, the keyframe, and I come back and just messes up, so I can just merge those shape keys together, and now I have a one F curve. And animating with one F curve is very easy. I'm usually using this operator when I'm done with sculpting, and I know that I have final uh, sculpts, and I want to, to create easier animating process, so to create easings and use that. And the last uh, part is, Post-processing, or as I call it, cape shape face. Uh, sorry, key mesh face. So, now after I'm done animating, there is a workflow that can take up to like entire work day, which I need to prepare each of the faces that I created for printing. I need to do three booleans on them. I need to cut the face, cut the neck. I need to attach the magnet holders. And we can't do that beforehand because we don't want them affected by uh, multi-res. We don't want to... Um, uh, when, you shrink, when you pull down the neck, we don't want the hole to shrink and, and stuff. And I also need to draw the number on the back of the head so that we, when we print out, we know which face is for which um, frame, uh, which object is for which frame. And the problem is that not only do I have to do that, I, this is what my scenes look like sometimes. I might have a 49 faces, which can go up to 20 million faces and polygons and it's a mess, it's very, it gets very slow and it slows me down a lot and I need to like manually move my camera like one by one to do these operations. And uh, the bigger problem is that we have, we're using a solidify modifier to make those faces non-manifold to print them. And the solidify just basically extrudes along normals. So if, when we have on the lips, well, the normals, the, the lower lips normals look up and the upper lips normals look down, when they are, um, extruded, sometimes those extrusions go inside each other and create those artifacts that you can see here and I need to manually clean them. Now the biggest problem was that when I'm cleaning them and I'm smoothing out on the faces, I don't have ability to preview anymore. I don't have the ability to compare it to the previous frame and the next frame because there's no animation anymore, they're separate objects. And I needed them to be animation again, uh, to have the ability to uh, not just eyeball it and just move the camera aside. Okay, does it look same? Oops. Uh, so I needed to keep the animation somehow and I realized uh, what was the solution. So key mesh is, if you don't know, one of the most iconic Blender add-ons. It's created by Pablo de Baro. Uh, the project was headed by Daniel Martinez Lara and they are, they are both associated with Blender. They worked here and Daniel still works here. And um, 
So it's an add-on that is used for creating stop-motion animations inside Blender. And I use that add-on for my other stuff, my personal projects mostly, and I decided to upgrade that, and I called it Keymesh 2, just to differentiate. It's the same add-on, but I rewrote it, I added some new features, now it works with curves, now it has many new features, and I knew that it, it was bothering me, it, it was bothering me for a while that I had two add-ons that deal with uh, the stop-motion animation, uh, and I cannot use them both because one is for the 3D stop motion and one is for the real stop motion. And how do I bridge that? That was a personal challenge for me. How do I use the, the key mesh into my workflow? And one day it, it was all sp uh, sparkles in the head and I realized how I can use it. If you don't know how key mesh works internally, uh, basically in Blender you have one mesh data associated with one object. Each object is basically a frame, empty frame, that holds the data that you give in the mesh tab. What Kimish does is that Kimish gives objects the ability to have as many meshes as you want, and you can keyframe each mesh. So that on frame six, for example, you can have cube, on frame eight, you can have Susan, on frame 10, you can have cone. You can have as many meshes as you want, and when you scrub through the timeline, you create this uh, illusion of motion. And I realized that I am already creating many, many meshes. I'm creating 49 meshes on each time. And I know on which frames they should be. So what I just need to do is I just need to assign them uh, to one object instead of 49 different objects. And if I just tell them on which frame which face should go, when I scrub through the timeline, I will have the animation. And with the key mesh, it's very easy because key mesh uses custom properties. It's that easy. So I just created an operator that uh, assigns each of these uh, mesh to uh, uh, each of the mesh a custom property and assigns them under one object. And you can see in this case, I have this uh, uh, the shape key animation and I press uh, shape key to key mesh operator. I specify the frame range that I want. And I think there's a waiting time here. There's, there's a couple of seconds you have to wait when you do that. I should have cut out this part, but yeah. Oh, now all the shape keys are gone because now they are applied, they are separate meshes, but I have this new UI that has, that has all the meshes and I have the same exact animation, nothing's changed, but now they are separate meshes. And that gives me ability to work on each of them separately without affecting previous or next frames and know that I can still have the animation and I can still 3D print them as much as I want. Uh, and this is what the, the UI looks like. The, the, the top part is just for regular animation. You can manually uh, create keyframes you want and new meshes. And I have uh, this frame picker which I created which just tells me which uh, mesh I have on frame with this um, icon. And if I use the darkened icon, the pin icon, I can just append those, oof, append, wait, append, okay. <laughs> append the, uh, the meshes on the certain frames. And because of that, I also have numbers of time used because I, each mesh can be used multiple times during the timeline. So basically, I created the, the way to instance frames. This is a thing that was inspired by Toon Boom Harmony and it exists in 2D animations. Now it's gonna exist, I know, in Grease Pencil 2. So back again with the duplicates problem, I have these duplicates on frame four and six. How do I tackle that? Well, basically, because I have the naming convention, well, shape key detects that the frame six looks exactly the same as frame four because they have the same name. It will instead assign, in creating instead of creating a new mesh, it will assign the mesh that was on the frame four on the frame six. So I have instances now. And if I decide for some reason to sculpt and elongate this face for, for some reason, now on frame four and frame six, they both get changed, so now I get preview of the animation, I can scrub through the animation, I can keep whatever I want, and also I can, I do not have to work twice as much because they are uh, on the two or more frames. And this is how I use in a workflow, it's a uh, one minute video, sorry about that, but the first uh, I'm using this, uh, the strings I have in the, the, uh, the UI so that I can name each mesh, whatever I want. It's not a mesh, it's a, it uses custom string properties, it's diff different, but so in this case, I'm just scribbling numbers on them. 
and I can go through the entire timeline and I just have my camera in a position, I just go on certain uh, next frame, I sculpt, I go to next frame, I sculpt, I go next frame, I sculpt, and when I play the animation back, which will happen soon, it will play the animation with all those uh, scribbles, and I, I do this with the booleans too. Uh, you can see, I do this with the booleans on three of the booleans, and if you use bool tool and apply the modifier, you can just do this for each mesh, for each frame. And I'll, I can also now uh, automate the booleans because they are in the same place, it's much easier, but I don't do that, I don't trust booleans that much. Uh, and uh, creating separate objects from them is easy. It's just the same operator, I use the same slide here. Uh, basically, what I realize once you have the two separate objects of the uh, the operator down, all you need to do is change the naming conventions. Because instead of like using uh, mesh names, you can use whatever naming conventions you want and it will just work the same. For example, if I ever decide to use rigged animation, I can create naming conventions based on bone rotations and locations. I can create one uh, naming convention with the geometry nodes modifiers and their values and it's all the same, it work, works all the same. So I create objects and I send them to Lasha, he prints them, he does all the scaffolding and stuff in, uh, in the software, I don't know how it works, and then we paint them. There shall be a video, but it doesn't play, it's okay, we, we paint them each by hand, this is Lasha, by the way, and we create stencils with uh, the, the papers and masks so that we can isolate brows, we can isolate mustaches and lips on each object, and we paint them. Well, not, uh, I say we, and I don't mean uh, me specifically, but we now, because we are printing so much faces and we have so much work to do, we uh, get new people and we are expanding. We need more people who paint, we need more people who print, and we now have a team that does this job. And for organization, I shamelessly stole the idea from Pinocchio film that they use pizza boxes to store the faces. And uh, in Georgia, yeah, in Georgia, we like pizza, but we have our pizza-shaped food one of them is called Lobiani, which we love a lot, and we order it all the time on the set. So we just use its boxes and we uh, um, organize them. And the last one is that I create uh, spreadsheets so that I can keep uh, information like on which frame, what is, has to be used, what is hold, what is a transitional frame. I name them all and everything, scenes, shots, everything, and I just give this information to the stop motion animators and they create this once again. So this is it. If you have any questions, you can ask me now or you can just admire the work. That's, that's what I had to say. So if, if there's no questions, I don't see any. Okay. I, have, I don't really have a question, but... Okay. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking that like, you were copying the objects and then removing the shape piece and like, going through steps in Python that were very specific to your workflow in order to create what Blender already created for you in the work. Yeah. So I think it should be possible to get the evaluated copy what Blender was shown in the viewport and call, just copy back to a new object. And that way you don't have to know even that you're using shape piece. You're just telling Blender I think copy of Okay, so the animation uh, development part is on board. That's good to hear. So there was a question back, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, no, that's a good question. I don't because the, most of the time when the shapes are used and uh, it's when I have like going into the motion and going out of the motion. For example, uh, the character smokes a lot and when she's exhaling and leaps go in, you know, in a certain shape and then goes back to the regular shape, it's just the same frames, you know, it's just going in and going out. So if I change going in, it doesn't matter going out, it still looks the same. So I don't have that problem. So I, I've never had that problem yet. Yeah, is there any more? Okay. Uh, 
No, we can use remesh because we need to have multi-res on it, and we cannot get rid of it. Yeah. Okay, is that it? I will. Uh, we're out of time. We need to prepare this for the next presenter. So thank you very much. This is our information. Uh, So if you want to get in touch, if you want to get in touch with studio, you can do it. If you're a studio especially, we would like to have uh, studio friends. So contact us, or if you have any questions, if you have any follow-ups, you can uh, contact me on any of these social media. And don't, don't forget to follow. I need more followers. Thank you very much.